السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس کیسے ہیں ٹھیک ٹھاک ٹوڈے ٹاپک از اباؤٹ ووکل کارڈ پیرالسز اینڈ ایمرجنسی ٹریکارسٹی ایز ہیو بی ڈسکسڈ ان اور پریویس ٹاپک اباؤٹ دی نیو پلاسٹک ریجنز اف لیرنگس سو دیر از امپورٹنس ان دیٹ کنیکشن اف to card paralysis because it is a complications of multiple diseases or a sequelae of multiple laryngeal diseases and tracheostomy is in a, uh, a relieving or you can say a life saving procedure which we usually do in different uh, cases either some neurosurgical cases traumatic cases rta cases or any diseases that are in progress to cause vocal cord paralysis and give some airway obstruction to the patient so we'll starting with vocal cord paralysis or vocal cord paralysis if you see we can categorize it into different categories like congenital and acquired usually the true vocal cords are involved in vocal cord paralysis and uh, it can either be bilateral unilateral means only one vocal cord involved or both are paralyzed apnea when occurs it is a acute emergency and it usually occurs in bilateral vocal cord paralysis we never get apnea rare rarely we get apnea in patient with only a single vocal cord paralysis then if you are talking about the congenital laryngeal paralysis it is usually associated with some nervous system lesions like hydrocephalus ernal chiarin malformation meningocele and cephalocele you see all these are some neurologic uh, deficit or diseases or neuromuscular disorders myasthenia gravis usually uh, get such paralysis or such laryngeal anomalies in patients in children congenitally and these are usually linked with some uh, nervous system so the underlying neurological causes for unit or bilateral vocal cord may sort out in pediatric patients when a baby is born and uh, gynecologist or pediatrician see some sort of uh, neurological deficit in that children so they usually sort out what is the underlying cause and if needed the uh, uh, otolaryngologist story this specialist is called on for further intervention like precursor and so on so the incidence of such cases we will discuss it either congenital or acquired what are the uh, reasons or what are the etiological congenital paralysis are a bit more than the acquired and the in coming to the acquired group it can be uh, further categorized into traumatic infectious and tumors starting again from the <coughs> congenital starting from the birth of the patient the baby usually at the time of birth baby get traumatized <coughs> during delivery due to stretching muscles of the mother during delivery process and sometime it can occurs due to a forceps deliveries i usually have uh, discussed it with you trauma can cause some vagus where, where, wherever vagus nerve is involved or stretch or pressed it can cause some sort of paralysis facial paralysis we have discussed earlier and here we can discuss that trauma can cause the uh, vocal cord paralysis also <coughs> so other than this is uh, 
surgical procedures. Surgical procedures when we are doing thyroidectomy and recurrent laryngeal nerve is traumatized, facial nerve paralysis can cause can occur. <clears throat> and uh, any other surgeries or RTA or trauma accidents, etc., they can cause a vocal cord paralysis due to injury to the vagus nerve. So uh, one thing is most uh, is, is a, uh, uh, we have a clear uh, message that the vagus nerve, wherever it is damaged or wherever it is compressed, it can cause a vocal cord paralysis in one way or the other. While doing surgeries like uh, bronchogenic cyst or tracheoesophageal fistula while repairing it, because these these are the structure where vagus nerve is or recurrent laryngeal nerve is lying somewhere in the vicinity. Next, when coming to the infectious diseases, uh, earlier uh, about decade or three before, the woofing cough and encephalitis or polio, you are very much familiar with it, diphtheria and rabies, tetanus even, syphilis, botulism. These were the diseases which were supposed to cause the uh, vocal cord paralysis in the same way. But now some of the disease are fading away from our society or worldwide, we can say. Uh, but still, yes, <clears throat> if these diseases occur in some, in some patients, there are chances of uh, paralysis. So the most important one is the tumor. Tumors <coughs> of the brain or spinal column, spinal cord is directly related uh, uh, with the nerve, nervous system, with the nerves. They can cause the unilateral or bilateral paralysis. <laughs> Right, so these are some categories which we get, uh, which we, about which we must have a knowledge uh, regarding the facial uh, vocal cord paralysis. The pathophysiology actually of bilateral vocal cord paralysis it not, is not that much clear cut, but uh, the condition that I have discussed you, with you that the compression of the vagus nerve through its course start from the brain to foramen magnum to its uh, downward uh, downward course wherever it is compressed or uh, damaged injured that can give a patient with vocal cord paralysis. Uh, Traction of the cervical group as uh, uh, rootlets of the vagus nerve or cordial displacement. All these are come in the under the heading and come in the pathophysiology. Brainstem dysgenesis is also one of the cause. Uh, there are different uh, authors work on this. Research has been done <clears> on <throat> these conditions that, but it has uh, accepted by many of them that uh, a timely decompression of the, uh, in special in congenital diseases, the vocal fold can regain function if it is a timely with, uh, without any delay. It can give a positive or better effect. The persistent apnea after tracheostomy is also one of the cause. If uh, a tracheostomy is done in a patient, uh, <clears throat> prolonged, in some cases we get a patient in which we do, do tracheostomy. Their tracheostomy remains for a long time. Sometimes that can cause uh, vocal damage, vocal cord damage, and give some sort of, in one way or the other, some uh, weakness or paralysis of the vocal cord. 
So <coughs> there are many mechanisms that can cause vocal cord paralysis. Ligands like uh, in subglottis stenosis or subglottic diseases, conditions, laryngomalacia or posterior laryngeal clefts also been associated. Not caught, cause that much uh, paralysis. Signs symptoms of uh, vocal cord paralysis or laryngeal lesions. We know that the larynx has some functions like respiration, voice production, that is phonation, and deglutition helps in <coughs> swallowing deglutition. These are all these, one or all of these uh, functions can be affected. Uh, so <coughs> if we can see that the unilateral vocal fold, if one vocal cord is paralyzed, the voice is usually breathy, weak, but the patient have an adequate airway unless stress. It means that <clears throat> the patient is not in discomfort that much. He can do he can do his normal daily activities, but whenever it is stressed, stressed, whenever the patient is supposed to talk more, whenever the patient do some exertion whenever the patient have some activity like running or that. So exertional activities can stress upon and in that case the patient may have some some problem in breathing. Otherwise the patient is with vocal unilateral vocal cord paralysis is hoarse. So that is the second function that is voice production that is effective. Deglutition, no, there is not any uh, effect on the uh, deglutition. And respiration, that is the breathing that can occur when the patient is exerted. Strider, that is difficulty in breathing and problem in breathing. Or weak crying in uh, children <coughs> or more hoarseness in adults, even in children. That is to some degree of respiration distress can seen in all patients with bilateral vocal cord paralysis. So when there is bilateral vocal cord paralysis, the condition is now different. Stride is there without much exertion, usually at rest, the patient gets. Second is that is respiration is affected, and definitely, definitely, voice production of phonation is affected, and hoarseness is a bit more. So, if both the recurrent, there is one thing, if recurrent and superior laryngeal nerve, both are paralyzed, air will be, airway will be a bit sufficient. And uh, <coughs> the reason for it is because the vocal uh, fold or vocal cords are in the intermediate position can say it's in an intermediate position. So the airway flow is a bit normal and the patient is not in much distress in regarding airway or breathing. So because the uh, vocal cords are not completely adapted, not completely blocking the airway uh, you can say this uh, space between the two vocal cords. <clears throat> so the patient is not in <clears throat> that much distress. The reason is that the vocal cord is at an intermediate position. But if the recurrent laryngeal nerve only is paralyzed, so there is an inadequate airway because the, in this case, the strider is most frequent and the vocal cords in this case are in the paramedian position. If both superior and, if we, if both superior and current are involved, then it is in the intermediate position. But if the current uh, laryngeal, recurrent laryngeal nerve is only paralyzed, then the airway is in an inadequate position due to the vocal, 
fold, vocal fold, vocal cord position are pyramidian. So this you must have an idea and must you know. Shared with bilateral vocal paralysis, usually the onset is very sudden. And uh, we can see it in uh, all group of patients, but in older children or in adults, it while laughing or coughing increases the respiratory demand. And in that case, the uh, strider get worse because it depending upon how much it is used, how much the uh, vocal cords are utilized. So while coughing or talking excessively or laughing, these are the conditions in which the, uh, there is increased demand of the respiratory demand. So in that case, strider is more. So, and uh, aspiration and dysphagia are frequently noted in patients with bilateral vocal cord paralysis because the vocal cord position are, are in a bit adapt, adapted position. So when the patient usually, we see when the patient drinks water, he complains of coughing. Why? Because the vocal cords are not completely closed while uh, swallowing. So solid food can be swallowed easily, but fluid, that can aspirate and the patient get worse and coughing and that and the patient usually <clears throat> have a difficulty in such condition. Diagnosis uh, for the vocal cord paralysis, there are different uh, methods of diagnosis, starting from the history as we uh, take history from the patient we heard for the nice if it's children, if it's a baby, infant. We heard for the cryotic, how the voice production is there. And uh, then in uh, our OPDs outdoor, we can examine the patient by doing the indirect laryngoscopy. And if we have the facility, we can do a flexible laryngoscopy. So we can see the vocal fold vocal cords, conditions of status at that time. The next is direct laryngoscopy. Direct laryngoscopy we do in the OT and we give general anesthesia to the patient where it is also called DL. And we uh, see for the vocal cord paralysis, but in DL and the flexible laryngoscopy, there's one difference. Because in flexible laryngoscopy, we can see the actual <clears throat> movement even of the patient of the vocal cord. But in direct laryngoscopy, we can see the pathology and we can do some intervention like biopsy or if you do a CO2 laser for removing of any sort of pathology. Yes, but uh, flexible laryngoscopy or IDL, these are mandatory before going for uh, general anesthesia. And in different, definitely the examination of the vocal fold mobility is a bit difficult and required much expertise. Uh, the diagnosis of uh, the vocal fold paralysis, how it is made is made in the airway should be secured if the airway is distressed because uh, before we going for uh, any further intervention or anything like that, we must need some uh, anesthetic help. So the diagnosis should be made first and we will go first for non-invasive investigations or non-invasive examination. And after that, <clears throat> for any further uh, investigation or examination them that may need anesthesia. So the diagnosis of the vocal fold paralysis made on the airway should be secured if the airway is in distress. Definitely uh, airway that it is a part of that ABC that is ATLS in which the airways come on the top of the list. Intubation, yes, if we need following in the workup 
we can do intubation and for that we uh, need general anesthesia. If the compression of the nerve is relieved, what happens if the compression of the vagus nerve or recurrent laryngeal nerve is relieved in the 24 hours, especially in the children and babies, it can give a better and good effect. And the function can be regained within easily within two weeks. Or the vocal function may not return in case of vocal cord paralysis for an year. Then this is a uh, then that sometimes it causes a permanent damage. So if the such uh, intervention has been done timely within time earlier, then the larynx, then the patient can get a better prognosis or better uh, results. So, if there is no evidence of function within one or two weeks, a tracheostomy is uh, one of the can say one of the best and mandatory intervention to be done. If the stress is not relieving or the patient is getting worse or any vocal cord paralysis when in which other uh, regimes applied doesn't work, then the trichostomy is mandatory to be done. And once the trichostomy is placed, periodic examination is necessary to uh, assess the <coughs> vocal cord function because we we just bypass by trichostomy, by we bypass the larynx, actually. We bypass the vocal fold. We bypass all the above laryngeal part of the airway tract. And we uh, put, insert the trichostomy tube below the cricoid cartilage in the second or third tracheal ring in that area. And so now we have the time to assess the vocal cords, vocal folds, and investigate the patient. Because if the patient is in distress, it is difficult for the surgeon, for the physician, for the pediatrician to uh, work up in such patient. So first, the life-saving procedure or the life is important so that the, we can have a bit relaxed uh, <clears throat> environment and the patient must be not in distress. So in that case, the uh, physician or the laryngologist can uh, help better in that, uh, can have a better results. So in approximately 50% of children with bilateral vocal cord paralysis require trichostomy. As I have discussed earlier, that when there is bilateral vocal cord paralysis, the patient is in much more distress and he cannot tolerate any uh, increased respiratory demand. So in that case, uh, uh, the trichostomy is mandatory. Similarly, in adults, in adults, when there is a tumor, and there is laryngeal tumor, and there is a CA larynx, and the patient is getting distress, the strider is more, the respiratory demand is more than we do trichostomy before any other intervention. Same, when I have discussed earlier, that the <clears throat> first is to relieve the patient from distress and then work up. So sometimes we get a patient in our outdoor uh, with hoarseness and the patient develop a strider, patient develop a respiratory uh, difficulty. So in that case, we do the trichostomy as an early intervention. And then we work up with CT scan or MRI or whatsoever else we, if we need, we can do biopsy, everything. So that is mandatory, both in children and adults, because as we have discussed that there are multiple reasons of vocal cord paralysis, starting from trauma, to the tumors. So whatever be the reason, if the patient is having a laryngeal problem, this is the message when the patient is having a laryngeal problem in distress, the respiratory demand is more, the patient is getting worse. So, and we are 
doing our work so the patient must be need to be relieved from the respiratory distress the second is the patient is having rta and uh, there is a, some sort of brain death and the patient the respiratory centers are uh, affected and the patient can cannot uh, do spontaneous respiration breathing so again the trick has to be mitigated so you can see that there are multiple multiple reasons for the tracheostomy to be done collagen augmentation have been educated in children with unilateral this is a treatment that uh, uh, collagen fibers for collagen augmentations they, these are put in the uh, later to the vocal cord in the unilateral vocal cord paralysis to bring it in a bit uh, middle position and the uh, long term effect of collagen in developing larynx these are some sort of treatment in children now coming to the emergency tracheostomy we have a bit uh, discussion about the tracheostomy an emergency tracheostomy it can be done for the multiple purposes and one of them is also a glottic foreign body a patient having a foreign body impacted somewhere in the larynx above the vocal cords or at the vocal cords and the patient there is no other way we have to do an emergency tracheostomy in such cases also so there are two types of sort of uh, tracheostomy one is the elective tracheostomy the other is emergency tracheostomy emergency tracheostomy what I, uh, what we have to do we are in a bit hurry and we are have to do the tracheostomy as soon as possible without without caring any other uh, things because the patient is getting in distress and the patient is getting lost his life or her life so we have to do an immediate intervention and so what we do in, i will discuss a bit with you about the uh, elective tracheostomy in elective tracheostomy like patient with clrx like patient with some congenital anomaly or the patient with rta we if we have a time we can do elective tracheostomy that or a patient is in iv uh, sorry in icu and is intubated like we are getting such cases in nowadays in the corona covid positive patient intubated so elective tracheostomy we do in such cases that we have a time and the patient or long standing in endotracheal intubation the patient who is intubated for a long time for a week or two or three or the uh, physician expect that the patient will remain on the ventilator and will be intubated for more than a two three weeks then it is mandatory to do the tracheostomy because to bypass the larynx because prolonged intubation can damage the vocal cords and can give uh, some sort of other uh, disabilities so for the patient with the tetanus also you do a tracheostomy because the uh, intubation in that case is also a, a bit a distressful condition the somewhat a bit difference in emergency in um, elective tracheostomy is that in emergency the incision is given vertically starting directly down to the trachea from the cricoid cartilage edge uh, we do because we spare the cricoid cartilage always and the aim is to uh, make a cut or incision or hole in the second and third tracheal ring ultimately we approach the second and third tracheal ring whatever the incision be in elective tracheostomy we usually give incision horizontally to follow the uh, natural creases of the neck to avoid more scarring or etc but in emergency tracheostomy <coughs> we usually give a 
a direct incision, a vertical longitudinal incision on the trachea from the cricoid cartilage down to the uh, fourth, third, fourth uh, tracheal rings. And then we, what we do? We separate the strap muscles. While removing the strap muscles, we continuously palpate the uh, trachea with the finger. If in infants, it is a bit difficult to palpate because it is a soft and flat, floppy like uh, cartilages. An adult, it is a bit calcified and a bit hard, and we can note it properly. So, we separate the strap muscles and we uh, 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 denude the trachea from the mucosa and we see a clear tracheal ring. There, this is the point where we can give incision or cut in the uh, tracheal rings, second, third tracheal rings. There, we give incision and then we put a tracheostomy tube. We can insert endotracheal tube <coughs> if we don't have any facility of the tracheostomy tube at the moment or any other tube we can put in the trachea. Two, the main aim is to secure the airway. So that's why it is given the name of uh, emergency tracheostomy because you may have not much facilities, you may not have uh, much of the instruments at that time. <coughs> and if you have, yes, then the uh, procedure is the same for the both. Just one difference is the incision. In children, I have uh, told you because it is uh, the difficult intubation, inspect the larynx, brain to remove the endotracheal tube, the surgeon is not. These, these are some uh, of the complications or procedures while we do in tracheostomy and we can get some problems. <coughs> tracheostomy units, I have discussed because it is a soft and difficult to palpate and the initial incision. In such case, you can give incision vertical or horizontal. Uh, but the uh, usually we do vertical incisions. Frequent palpation of the trachea while separating the strap muscles, I have told you. And dividing the uh, thyroid estimus, we uh, usually uh, elevate or retract the thyroid estimus above so that the vision should be clear. Second to third, four, <coughs> four tracheal uh, cartilages or rings, these are the set that we do usually in the second and third tracheal ring. Dissection should be blunt because there are possibility of uh, lung damages. And usually the lung epicis in the infants are a bit above as compared to the adult. And there are more and more chances of damaging the lung epicis in infants. In adults, the lung epicis are a bit below and there because the neck is fully developed, the cartilages are fully developed. And in uh, such cases, uh, we are far away from the lung epicis. Second, we get some complications usually at different in different patients because one patient is different from the other. If the patient is obese, if the patient is short neck, there are difficulties practically in such patient. If the patient is obese, the neck is uh, uh, swollen, we, the fat are there, so we have to uh, do much expert, need much expertise and uh, <coughs> care. And uh, if uh, uh, when we usually get in a TA case and there is some mandible fracture and the uh, neck is swollen and uh, uh, edematous, in such cases, the tracheostomy is also difficult. So whatever the mean uh, protocol and the main procedure for tracheostomy is this, to spare all these uh, important structures. Right, once the stoma is <coughs> created, the stoma means that the opening of the tracheostomy is created. So 
then the ventricle tube usually get in some patient we get what we get that the patient is intubated like patient is in icu and we have the time to intubate the patient if the patient is intubated already endotracheal tube is there and we do tracheostomy so while doing the tracheostomy at this time we are a bit safe because the uh, patient is already intubated and uh, we don't have to worry that we will get some problem while removing the tracheostomy uh, applying the tracheostomy tube the anesthetist remove the endotracheal tube when we get at our site of second and third tracheal ring and as the tip of the endotracheal tube is withdrawn the at the same time the immediately the tracheostomy tube is inserted this is one of the step of the tracheostomy which in an intubated patient so and after doing the tracheostomy you must know that yes you are in a proper place you have oxygenate the patient and look for the ventilation yes the ventilation is confirmed and oxygenation is confirmed <coughs> with the help of the monitor with the help of stethoscope the cuff the tracheostomy tube is uh, inflated so that it can be in place so a bronchoscopy if you have a bronchoscope you can evaluate the airway and perform the freezer you you can uh, look look at the with the help of flexible bronchoscope yes everything is fine and everything is is it is especially for the infants and children not for the for the adults the principal palpation of the trachea repeatedly with clear identification of the tracheal ring is the key before incising the trachea that i have discussed with you earlier that while doing the tracheostomy you have to continuously palpate the trachea you are uh, uh, retracting the strap muscles you are at the same time you are you palpate the trachea that yes you are in a proper plane yes you are in a proper plane because there are uh, many complications during the procedure and that is if you miss the trachea and you go down go down without palpating the trachea without locating the trachea you may the trachea may be may be shifted to one side and you you may go directly below the trachea into the esophagus or sometimes to the cervical spine or carotid arteries so that is the main complication of the procedure while doing tracheostomy so when tracheostomy is done when the tracheostomy procedure is done, take do the superficial where superficial anatomy you must know the superficial anatomy of the trachea starting from the uh, thyroid cartilage palpate while you are doing uh, giving incision when you give incision every time you must you must palpate the tracheal ring as yes you are in plane if you uh, uh, get some deviation from the trachea try to locate it and when you are in a proper plane so the main aim is when you are doing tracheostomy tracheostomy you must be on a straight line in the mid line or the trachea sorry or the trachea and whenever you feel that you are missing the tracheal rings so leave it and start again by palpation and when you get a proper point of the tracheal ring because when it is, when we palpate the tracheal ring it is a bit hard and we can palpate with the finger uh, like uh, rings one one and uh, uh, one and the other and the other and we have a space between the two tracheal rings so this is mandatory otherwise you will get with an endless complication and uh, uh, if the carotid arteries are injured or the spinal cervical spinal injured and you if you are in esophagus so it means you are not a proper pain so this is important thing that's why in the previous slide that the 
oxygenation and ventilation must be confirmed. This is the, uh, if you do, because if you uh, insert a tricastomy tube in a wrong place, you will never get oxygenation and ventilation of the patient. At once tricastomy is done, the uh, tricastomy tube usually be changed at the fifth or sixth day to replace or if uh, replacing is important and if not replacing, the tricastomy tube is taken out, it is clean, cleared and again it is inserted. Because within 24 to 48 hours, the stroma is made and there are uh, very less chances of uh, that it, uh, we get lost in the stroma. So you must have the or proper instrumentation, like tracheal dilator or the instruments on the uh, with the patient while cleaning or replacing the tricastic tube. It is better to replace the tricastic tube. You have a tracheal dilator. You remove the <coughs> Tracheostomy tube, put the tracheal dilator that you must be in a plane and then insert a new uh, tracheostomy tube. So these are the some steps and tips of the tracheostomy and emergency tracheostomy. So you must know all about this. And the next is the uh, care of the tracheostomy tube. The care of the tracheostomy tube is to Make it clean, number one. Second, if there are some secretions or crusting, it must be cleaned out with the help of suction machine. And uh, if the crusting is hard, you can uh, put a saline or in the gastrimi uh, tube with the help of a saline, two or three, four cc, and then suck it out so that it can be uh, lower down area can be clear. So, and <clears throat> If it is a filter, the tricastomy tube have a filter. If not, you can put a wet, clean gauze over the tricastomy opening so that the air which the patient inhale must be moist. And uh, room temperature is also have an importance. So because the tricastomy tube is an open uh, tube at the outer side, so care must be taken that some thing may not enter the tricastomy tube. So in that way, a uh, uh, filter or a wet gas piece is important. Okay, thanks.